Hello, Shocked friends. Welcome to the Show to Be Named Later podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Boss, along with a guy that never gave up hope, Noah Storzinger. How you doing? It's a good hey, day. Now, I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat, I love being wrong. I love it. You know what I mean? And and but what I what I found interesting is that uh, completely wrong on some of I guess uh, my observations. Except we were so right on a lot of the things that we talked about that needed to needed to happen. But um, you know, once again, we are we are we are slated for a long a long pull here because we've got a lot to talk about. Because dare I say it, Noah? Do we live in Minnesota? I mean, what what is going on here? We we've got to cover the Vikings draft, the Twins winning seven games in a row, and of course, you you want to break it to to everybody right now. I think you I think you have the uh, the honor, sir. What well, else are the, we going to talk about? It for the first time in since two thousand four, the Wolves are playing in the second round of the playoffs. I love it, and the first Minnesota team to ever sweep. Four games, uh, seven game series of four games in a row. Oop. Well, can I get away with that? I mean, I think the Lynx did sweep, but I don't, I don't know if the grueling three game playoff series if that counts. No. Uh, but, but I, I guess at least the way it's never been a seven game series that a Minnesota team has ever swept. And uh, man, that felt good, didn't it? It felt real it, good. I mean, every every game you just felt more and more confident, and and just. It, it was it was a surreal experience. I'm not gonna lie, just because I've never seen it, and I mean, I got to watch some playoff baseball last year with uh, with the Twins, saw some winning there, but this one just felt a little better. I don't know why. I well, it it, it did, and I've I've got to give you now what you use the, the the term flowers. I'm not familiar with that, but we used to say props back in my day. And I've got to give you props because there were a, a couple of things. One of the things I love about having um, Noah doing the show with me is that he has that young uh, energy that I, I once had uh, maybe, maybe 25 years ago that, that continues said, Hey, Johnny, you got to wait. The playoffs are different. Edwards is going to show up for the playoffs. The intensity is going to be different in the playoffs. And I'm just so used to what has always been, um, and, and here's the deal. No, I was, I was 31 years old before the Wolves ever won a playoff series. So you have already got me beat by about five or six years. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, it's, <laughs> it got some years there, but it's, it's been a long time. All right. And, and so, you know, as I always like to brag about being a teacher, I, I believe Noah was the teacher and I, I was the student this time because I had already chalked it up as, as, as a loss, I believe I said Phoenix in five. And I think after I saw game one, I completely changed that. I was like, well, but that's only because we were slamming the table and saying, this has to change now. And, and that's, that's pretty much the, the, the way it went uh, in, in the Phoenix series. It, it was, it was incredible. Um, let's get to uh, let's, let's get to the, you know, the, the rights that we had or why this playoff series happened the way that it did. You want to, you want to start off? Cause I got a number of things that, that I guess put us in the spot that we're in right now. I, I mean, I think the first of all is, is the game plan. Every game, it seemed like they had gone out and, and executed perfectly. I mean, you knew they were going to throw a double on Ant um, and he was able to, it just seemed like it never phased him. Um, guys stepped up. Uh, the defense was phenomenal. Um, I, I mean, that that team, when you really think of it, there's no way they should have kicked our ass in the regular season. When you really look at that team, um, we are just so much deeper. And, and the, the depth really played a part uh, in this series win. But at the same time, I think you got to start with Anthony Edwards and yeah. just talk about how, how different he was. I mean, this guy was averaging – like 35 points and he averages like 35 points in the playoffs right now. Um, and for the series, I mean, he had one game where he didn't, he didn't score a lot, but he impacted the game quite a bit. Yeah. I think that was game two. Um, but dropping a 40 piece in, in the, the game four win on, on their home full on their home floor is, is, is huge. Hey, Anthony Edwards is a complete stud. It, it, there's no, there's no getting around it. And maybe if game one would have gone differently and he 
would have got shut down and, and only scored 10 or 12 points. Maybe the series, especially at home, maybe the series would have gone a little differently. But Anthony Edwards came out in game one and absolutely said, nope, this is my series. It's going to be. And to your point, at game two, you know, none of the guys came out uh, in game two and we still kicked their ass. You know, Edwards, Towns, Nas Reed all had poor games and uh, there were there were some X uh, factors that that got us to a game three. Um, but yeah, right off the bat, Anthony Edwards. And, you know, it, it's funny because after game two where he, he didn't have such a great game, Shaq came right out and said, no, nah, he'll be fine. Don't worry about it. He'll be fine. And you you see all of the the constant uh, attention that Anthony Edwards is getting, not just locally, but nationally. And, you know, you got to think about it. Ticket. Kevin Garnett has every right to at least downplay the Minnesota Timberwolves for the way that they have treated him uh, in years past. Okay. And, you know, if, if I were him and I was at a certain age, if I saw a young whippersnapper that suddenly may overtake me as the face of the franchise, I might be a little salty about it. Not, not ticket class act all the way across the board, man. And said, go out and get all the records. Go just get them. Just win them. And, and talking about Timberwolves, all, all the Timberwolves records. And, and, you know, I think that, that that's a credit to who I've always said the ticket is. Um, and, and a credit, I mean, he could totally say, man, the Wolves, or a fucked up franchise, get out of there, uh, Anthony Edwards, right now. But he did. He he. All he did was say what everybody else is saying is that this guy is on a completely different level than anybody else in the NBA right now. I'm sorry, he is. No, he is. And and I every after every game I watched. Uh, I think it was first take. Stephen A. loves this motherfucker. I mean, yep. he is. Yep. Oh my god, he loves Anthony Edwards, and it's just fun because you don't really hear Stephen A. talk a lot about Minnesota sports. And I like Stephen A and I like to hear him talk about, I like to hear him talk about <laughs> Anthony Edwards. Um, but no, this guy, you know, they were talking about it. It's, it's not even so much the, the offensive side of the game, but also the defensive side of the game. Oh, this, is, this guy's a two way stud now. Yep. And the, the, the blocks that he had, the, the, you know, if, if KD was getting it going, he jumps on KD. If, if, if Booker was getting it, he jumps on Booker. I mean, if Beal was going to get it, he was going to jump on. But he takes – he he wants that matchup. He could easily, you know, let let whoever else guard him, whatever. But, no, he wants that matchup. And this guy has been more and more vocal recently. I don't know if you paid attention, but he is getting more and more vocal with his teammates and becoming right. a I mean, In a good way. In a good yeah. way. Because one of, the, one of the things that we put, you know, I think that I – stated about going into this series with, with Phoenix, you know, and I was, I was wrong about, but I said, these are the things that need to happen. And one of the things that I was extremely impressed with Anthony Edwards was this and keeping it in here. And you just didn't see anyone really on the team riding officials at all. They just tended to their game and, and yeah, as in anything, there's bad calls all the way across the board, but you just didn't see them focused or locked in on it. You know, and I, I think I said, I, I think we're going to see Edwards get ejected from one of these games. You didn't. And then the flip side of that is that, yeah, but he's still talking and he's talking to his teammates and he's making a difference uh, on, on the floor. And I'll tell you this, you know, I, I go back and forth about the, you know, the hot shot stuff. However, I was accused of being a glory boy uh, when I was a younger man, but I don't know if you saw at the end of game three. Edwards doing that to Phoenix, Phoenix uh, crowd. I don't care, man. Go get you some. You know, that was that was hilarious. I mean, there were you could see the video. All the fans are pointing like, and laughing. I mean, they're getting their ass kicked. Yeah, fuck. I mean, now boom. Like, I, will, <laughs> I, I will also say one of my favorite moments uh, was Game One when when Edwards just decided to take over in the second half and just kept hitting shot after shot. And yeah, he was talking shit to Durant. And I'll tell you what, I have the utmost respect for Kevin Durant. I mean, I don't know what else you can say, but for him to, to uh, 
to treat that situation the way he did. I thought it was genuine class. I don't think it was because he was intimidated or because uh, he he didn't have a, a comeback to him. I think he knew he was getting his ass kicked and the changing of the guards is now happening in Minnesota. All right. And so I just, I was really pleased with that. I, I thought Durant handled that. And, you know, everyone that, if, if you're on the outside looking in, maybe you're, you know, from, uh, you know, Bumble's knee Alabama and you don't understand Anthony Edwards or, or anything like that. And he, he comes off kind of as a chach. I, I don't buy that because right after he said, look, man, that's my idol. That's my favorite player is Kevin Durant. So, and, and you didn't hear Kevin Durant come out and go, man, I, I got no time for that guy. What a little punk ass bitch. It, it wasn't like that. I just thought it was a really cool uh, exchange down the floor. Maybe not for Mr. Durant and Phoenix fans, but um, boy, it, it, it got my engine going and it was already going at that point. It was a great moment. It, it was phenomenal. I was laughing my ass off watching it. Um, and you just couldn't have, help but just smile ear to ear when you were watching that. Um, I, I, I want to talk about game two. We talked about a big X factor, a guy who was on your list too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jaden McDaniels had himself the best game of his career, game two. Best game of his career, hands down. And I would say the entire series – uh, he is, he had made smarter choices. I mean, that corner three is still not going down the way I, I wish it would, although he had a big one last night, but that dunk was phenomenal and it's McDaniel's defense and him being able to pick up when other guys were not, were not being successful in that game too. I mean, I would say that Jaden McDaniel basically won game two for us. Don't you think with the energy that he had? Well, right, and it, it it all of a sudden that his energy changed when there was that um, flagrant foul or whatever with with Booker that uh, that exchange. Um, he immediately like I was like, well, this could be it for him. He's gonna get pissed. Yeah. He's gonna foul out. Whatever. Um, no, he, he took it right at him. He took it right at him and just said, "Screw this. I'm just." I mean, immediately like the next possession, I think had to dunk down the floor. Um, just played outstanding defense and scored the basketball with ease. Can. Can Jaden McDaniels, because I, I heard some of the local boys talking about it on the radio today, um, how they were waiting all season long and were concerned, just like I was, about the the amount of money or, or what we invested in Jaden McDaniels. And what we saw in the Phoenix series was the reason that we, we gave him that contract. Is he able to maintain that? Is Does he have the wherewithal to maintain that? throughout the, the remainder of the, of, of the playoff this season. I mean, I think they're playing with, with playing with fire right now. I, I, I don't see why he, he couldn't. I mean, this is his first big playoff series where they're going to continue to move on. I mean, you don't know about um, the, if they're going to get tired down the road and, 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 and how that's going to work out. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if he comes in with even more intensity for next round too, because you're looking at potentially Denver next round, and we got some some stuff to, to settle after last year. I, I agree, and and we'll get we're we're gonna get to that that upcoming probable probable series, um, but you know with with Jade McDaniel's, it was great to see somebody else perform so that it didn't fall on the same guys. Um, I think Alexander Walker was another guy that that okay. I didn't want to. I didn't. I don't want to. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, just steal your thunder or anything like that, but that dude is playing. And I would say this entire team, I don't think I've, I've seen them play with as much confidence as they played in the Phoenix series. Like not, not one of those games. I mean, there was times during game two and even last night in game four that I was like, we might lose. We might lose this game until it got to the second half. And then there was, Never that in the back of your mind where like you're waiting for the complete air to be taken out of all of your tires, not just one. All right. It, it never felt like that big drop was, was coming. And I got to say that the confidence of this team right now is through the roof. And I don't think a Denver matchup is going to pump the brakes on that at all. I think they really think they might have a, a chance at winning this whole thing. They, they absolutely believe that this is the team. And I, I'll tell you with Denver, I mean, 
we played some really good team, really good games with Denver during the regular season. Now it doesn't matter. We saw that with the Phoenix Suns matchup. However, I think they'll they're more fueled for that matchup based right. off of last year, and, especially and Mr. Anthony Edwards. Right, and and well, you know, I mean, last year we didn't have Nas, we didn't have Jaden, we certainly didn't have Alexander Walker. Okay, we had Towns who was eh. all right. So I mean, you're not talking about the same. The, the same team anymore, uh, Wolves versus Denver that we saw last year. Okay. You got what Reggie Jackson is now their backup when he didn't even get any minutes last year against us. Right. Um, and I, I've, I've got to believe that if you can keep it, the Joker is going to come play, but if you can keep him neutralized, let him get his stuff, whatever. But as long as you don't let him go above and beyond, I think it's a very winnable series. And I actually, when the playoffs began, I was like, I'd rather see Denver over Phoenix at that, at that, at that time. I think we had a, a better opportunity, but I'm man, if you can contain Murray and you can at least not allow Jokic to, uh, to go above everybody else. I, I think you got a great shot of winning the series. So Murray, I believe is hurt. Uh, I, I, he, he may, he probably, he'll definitely play. Right. Um, the, the, the thing with Jokic and what they always say is you let him score. Don't let him pass because well, once he's right. moving and passing, like that's when it just gets tough. Neutralize that. He's going to get his buckets. He's going to score 30 points. He's, he's just, he's going to score a lot of points. Um, and you got to live with that. But like I, like you said, you know, neutralizing the threat of the pass and, and using his teammates, that's what that that'll push us ahead. Well, um, you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I wanted to give my flowers to someone that I've been hyping up the whole season. And ever since we got him, you mentioned him. Um, but I think he is becoming probably one of the best role players in Timberwolves franchise history right now is Nikhil Alexander. Walker, this guy has been a stud. Yeah, I agree. Stud. I agree. And you've been you've been in his corner all year. Um, I guess I was not aware that he was going to give us uh, the kind of minutes in the playoffs uh, that that he has. But man, he has been. But but that's what I mean about the confidence level. It, you're not seeing a lot. I mean. Slow-mo is the only guy that isn't up at that level, and that's because he only moves negative five miles an hour. You know what I mean? It's not his fault. He, it's just not his kind of game, but he's still contributing to the team. And, and so it's like if, you know, if, if you were given a number one to ten and you say, okay, Edwards is a nine and a half, it's like he's playing at level 14 right now. All right. And with that, it, it, it seems like every other player on that team is playing um, above what their their regular PSR rating is. You know, if you watch Naked and Afraid, you know what I mean? Like it's it, it th that confidence level is so high that everyone is playing at such a high level. And I like I say, if if the Wolves play like they did against Phoenix, there's not a team in the NBA that's going to beat them. And, and I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm drinking Kool-Aid or I'm drinking, I'm on the bandwagon because that's what Minnesota fans do. I'm saying there aren't a lot of teams that if they played defensively the way they are and and they're able to, they're able to function offensively and function at a high rate in in some regards, not turn the ball over. There's not a lot of NBA teams this decade that would beat this team. I was going to say, you've got some of the three best scorers in the NBA on one team. Now, I get it. They don't have a point guard, and they absolutely needed a point guard to facilitate. But you had three players, minus last game, where, where Booker uh, and, and Durant had a lot. Um, they shut them down. Yep. They absolutely shut them yep. down. And I'm yep. so happy to see Bradley Beal had nine points right. in the last game <laughs> and fouled out. Uh, that guy's a joke. Great Grayson Allen would would not have mattered had he been healthy in this series. I really believe that. I, I do. And you know, one of the points that we made was you have to be able to get to their bench because we are so much deeper than the Suns. And I was like, yeah, but if you're down by 30, you know, you can't ever get to that point where they have the but man, we are such a better team than Phoenix. And and I think that was one of the rights we got 
uh, the, our, our last podcast, we said, this is not a great team on paper. And by the way, is this, is this true? Phoenix doesn't have a first or a second round pick until 2030. They're stuck with this team until 2030. They have mortgaged their entire future for these three guys on this team. Oh my, and my just spent a better. bunch of money on Grayson Allen. Man. So, Oof. Well, good, good luck. Good luck to that because I think that's what everybody thought the Wolves were going to be facing with Gobert and, and, and Towns. Uh, and man, uh, well, I don't feel sorry for Phoenix. They, they still have more championships than, than we do. So, um, all right. I can't believe that he is way down the totem pole, but I think it, it has to play into with what we're talking about. Carl Anthony Towns. Now, I, I've got a question for you because here's the thing. Towns, to me, in game two, he helped, even though he didn't have a great game, in game two, he got us going. I think he scored the first 10 points um, of maybe 10 of 12 points to get us going and at least to get us to a point where we got to, you know, we got to do it. Game four, he was hitting threes that I was just like, no, 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 no. boom. All right. Uh, He's even playing defense, Noah. I think you know the play I'm talking about where he was all over one, two, three guys. I mean, those were plays that you rewind. You got to watch over and over again because, and you're like, and so my question to you, Noah, is do you think that we're seeing a different Carl Anthony Towns in this playoff series because he is a way more comfortable with his, his role on this team? He knows Edwards is the guy that everyone's going to talk about at the end of the night. So all you got to do is just fill in the blanks when needed. But Carl Anthony Towns doesn't need to be the guy that's going to get you to the second round. That's all taken care of by one guy plus five other guys. So is Carl Anthony Towns, in your opinion, is he so much more comfortable that he's not forcing things? He's not looking stupid out there. He's just playing the game that we all wanted him to play. Absolutely. Because like you said, I mean, comfortability was, was my first point with him. And I mean, this guy just came, just came back from a meniscus yeah. tear. You, I did not expect him to play this way, but when you look at these, these past series, um, you know, you face a tough team last year, but when it, when it came to a big game towns, I think put it all on himself. And that's why all the narrative was, you know, can't cat can't play in big games. Uh, you know, he, he struggles in the playoffs. And now, like you said, he's got so much more around him. I was like, it's the same thing with Rudy Gobert. It's always good they're going to play him off in the play him off the floor in the playoffs. But that was when he was guarding the entire team when he was with Utah. Now he's got all these perimeter defenders around. I mean, Cat's the same way. He's got so many offensive weapons, um, and it's not that he's even having to sacrifice anything. Because I don't know if you watched their press conference at the end of the game. Someone had asked him, you know, you know, you've had to sacrifice whatever, whatever, and Ant looked at the reporter and it was just like he had 28 and 10. He wasn't sacrificing anything. He's still getting his shots up. Like this guy is still a huge, huge contributor. And now I think he's just playing more comfortable because he doesn't have this huge weight on his shoulders of pushing well, and, his team further. And that's what I love about Edwards is that he's not making anybody on that team feel like they're less, less of a player because you have Anthony Edwards on your team. I mean, he's not sticking his chest. Out. He's giving props to guys like Carl Anthony Towns. He's saying things that are so smart about, hey, man, we only won game one. That's it. You got to win three more. Or they don't put anything up in the rafters for winning a first-round playoffs here. You got to the – you got to – you know what I mean? You got to the semifinals of the Western Conference. Okay? That's fine. That you hadn't done anything yet. And and so that's what's great. But one thing that I had to think about uh, with the whole – and the last thing I want to talk about, Anthony Edwards, because I want to get back to Towns, but I don't think since we've had the ticket that we have had a number one guy uh, that you go, yeah, he, this is his team. Now think about it. They tried that with Andrew Wiggins, which was ridiculous. They should have known – being Canadian, that that would never have happened. All right. 
Carl Anthony Towns was supposed to be that guy. And I don't think that he ever was. Kevin Love was supposed to be that guy somewhat. And I think he was the best player that we had. And I think there were times that Towns was the best player that we had, but not one that you could go, this is, everybody going to come to watch Andrew Wiggins play. Everyone's going to come to watch Kevin Love play. Everyone's going to come watch Carl Anthony Towns play. No, everyone's going to motherfucking watch when Anthony Edwards comes to town to play. And if he's on TV, you better be fucking sure people are going to tune in. I don't think that Towns was ever at that. And, but yet you had to put it on him. Like it was his responsibility. And that's what I'm talking about. When I, when I talk about being comfortable, the, the, what I will give Towns is people have been tweeting this out. Um, you know, they said, you know, all those Shabazz Napier midcourt pull-ups were worth it for this moment right now because Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards has a squat right now. Carl Anthony Towns, when, ever since we drafted him, besides the Jimmy Butler year, think about those teams that, that he had. Jarek Culver, Josh Okoge, Shabazz Napier, Taj Gibson. It, it, ter- it We asked this guy to do so, so, so much. And yep. he took all the heat. He took all the public humiliation from Jimmy Butler. Um, I, I mean, and finally, Johnny I think he is getting his his recognition of this guy's a, a great basketball player and he's on a good team. I, I agree. But now, and, and how much, I mean, I don't you think that Towns was at a, a point in his career where he embraced that though and said, yeah, I am the man. You know, and, and that was... The, the big question was, is he going to be involved in this transfer of power as Anthony Edwards being the number one guy? But you got to remember, I mean, as much as I love Ticket, you did not see what you're seeing out of Ticket at 22 years old that you're seeing out of Anthony Edwards. You're not. And you're not seeing, no offense, Kevin Garnett, I love you so much, but you didn't see Kevin Garnett force a team to get to the second round. He only did it one time in his career. And I, it's not that, that Garnett had the talent that I think Edwards has around him, but I, but, but it's just something different right now with this team. And and they might lose four games in a row to Denver and, and we might have that. But my point is that I, what I love about this right now is there's always got to be like these building blocks to get, to an NBA championship where you go, well, you know what? They started out in 2024 and they had, but they just weren't there maturity wise or physical wise. They, they just, I'm telling you that I don't know if we need a lot of building block years to get to an NBA finals. I think we've got enough talent right now. I really do. I I think the building block years were losing in the playoffs for two straight years and, and, getting that experience because re- this team's relatively the same besides after, you know, the go bear flip. But um, even last year, I mean, this, te- this team is basically the same. You lost Torian Prince. That's about it. Yep. Um, so this team, this team absolutely has it. And, and Anthony Edwards, like you said, we, we weren't seeing this from KG at 22. Yeah. Um, and this is exactly why he is becoming the, the conversation of, is he the new face of the league? And, it's so weird to hear that because he's on our team and it's so fun. You've been saying that for a while. I know it, but who was it? I just saw, uh, who was it that just tweeted that out that it's like watching Michael Jordan out there right now, except, except Edwards is so much more fucking strong than, than Michael Jordan. I'm talking strong, you know what I mean? Um, it is it's different, and that's why you won't say he's gonna be the next Michael Jordan. No, he's the next Anthony Edwards. There it is. I love it. I I know I it. Love it. I love it. This guy is this oh my it's so, it's so another another question when we come back to towns because um I I kind of disagreed with not really. I mean, I, I go back and forth. Charles Barkley said something interesting about um towns about how way more effective he would have been if he would post up a little because obviously Phoenix only had one big man to throw and then threw him at Gobert. So uh, Towns should have been able to post up and he said it, it drives him nuts when he shoots all those threes except 
That's what he is. He's a three point shooter. Um, I disagree somewhat because I like the spacing that Towns gives on the perimeter. Um, and I think it can get too clogged if you got two big men. The only thing that there's somebody that brought something up that, man, I, I've been watching this guy play his whole professional career and it, it never hit me until it was brought to my attention was, yeah, his three, three point game is fine. When he drives and he's under control, he can get to the basket. That's fine. But can you imagine what kind of player Carl Anthony Towns would be if he could drive from the perimeter and pull up with the short range or the mid range jumper? That he would be a three tool offensive player automatically. And you never see him do that. You've never seen him pull up for a 10 or 12 foot jump shot. Cause I don't think his body can handle it. He's a huge guy. And all that freight coming down the lane, I don't know that you could put the brakes on that. Nas Reed, little different story. But yeah, but Kat, I, I don't know. We've seen a little but bit. But as a professional, you can't work on that and be able to figure figure out how to do that because I think it plays into what Barkley was saying about his, his post game. With your back to the basket, you should be able to take because you're bigger and stronger than the, the guys that are on you. However, um, like I say, I think I made my point about having two big guys under the basket. He, yeah, and look, I, I get frustrated with Charles Barkley because he, he in no way said the Timberwolves were were, yep, any good after this series win. And I just, I can't, I, he says some dumb shit, and I just, yep. anyways. Um, yep, I see but another thing to think about, like Cat traditionally, when they beat, when you beat Cat especially in the past is you'll throw a smaller defender on him in the post. And he, for whatever reason, can't, can't perform when they throw a smaller guy on him. Um, which is why I think he would have struggled in, in, in Phoenix. If you were to to throw even just Bradley Beal, throw him down there on him. I don't know that he would have done well, especially because of the spacing as well. Like if you got Gobert down there, like you're not going to throw Gobert on the perimeter. He's not going to just hang in the dunker spot the whole time. Right. Um, spacing the floor was absolutely necessary. I think if you, if you wanted to do two bigs, you look at, you know, the eighties off at what the offense looked like in the eighties. And it just, it's not the same game anymore. Yeah. And when this guy's one of the best shooters in the league, like throw him on the perimeter. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, should we, now I, I, I will preface this with saying Nas Reed had one of the coolest plays that all year that, that move that he had the over the top, was was incredible. It 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 got me out of my seat, and it's rare when I'm watching with friends that I run out of the room when I watch. But, but that was one of those plays. Should we be concerned about Nas Reed and the way he's played, or at least the way that he's looked in the series? No, we we said the same thing right before this guy went on a tear. First of all, we've never mentioned this guy just won six man of the year. Yep. So congrats, Nas Reed. Congratulations First there, time. buddy. Yep, absolutely. So it, this guy's a professional. I, I think that, you know, it, it's not every – everyone had so many good games. I mean, throwing another guy in there, like it's – it's you got to let other guys get some points here and there, um, uh, get their touches, whatever it may be. I, he definitely struggled a little bit, but um, no, I, I think Nas is going to come out and in Denver and have a good but, series. But, and don't you think that that will just because the matchups are a little different? I mean, you know, Denver's lineup is a completely different kind of lineup than we that we saw against Phoenix. So don't you think that we will see a little more of Nas or the game that that Nas brings? Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially especially if you if you introduce more Kyle Anderson, if you're trying to break a a zone or something, it's nice to have um, Nas work around the perimeter. Um, but that's the best thing about this team is you're not forcing Nas to have really good games every game because right. his whole teammate teammates picked him up. You know, if, if he's not going to have a good game, Nikhil's going to come out and have a good game. You know, if if uh, Nas has a good game one day, you're not forcing uh, a Kyle Anderson to to drop 15 a night, um, stuff like that. So that's why I think this team is so deep and it 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 helps and it takes pressure off of guys that are young like that, 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 that they don't need to come out and score 20 a night and, and really impact right. the game. There's guys that are going to do it. 
Right. Now, uh, one thing that I, I found interesting, I, I was reading uh, Jim Suan's uh, article on, on Sunday, Sunday in the Sunday uh, Star Trib. I like Jim Suan and I've talked to him several times, um, but I got to got to disagree with his way of thinking there in his uh, in his column on Sunday. He said basically he said you kind of wish the Suns would have given the Wolves um, just a little more competitive type series. Fuck you, Jim. No way. Are you? Have you watched the Wolves in the playoffs? Are you kidding? You wanted the Suns to be better in the playoff series when we had an opportunity to beat them four games in a row? No, I'm so glad that they laid a big shit burger. Okay, and the, and here's the thing about why I say what I do about that. I'm watching a game last night, and a team gave up a 31 point lead. And almost gave up the biggest NBA, the biggest uh, margin of point differential in NBA playoffs history. They own because they took the lead by one and then they were able to close the door. No way. If you can beat the Denver Nuggets in the upcoming series, if you are up in game one by 30 points, by God, you beat them by 40 points. And then in game two, you beat them by 50 points. None of this Harry High School, oh, I wish they would have given us a better series. And I, he wasn't even saying because it would be better for the Wolves in their next series. He just said it was disappointing to watch such a lopsided series. Fuck you, man. I, that's how I want it every time. There's a reason Phoenix laid a shit burger. It's because we executed the game plan and played tough yep. basketball. Yep. It, it's not because they, they just sucked. And we just weren't that good. And, oh, we, we squeaked out, whatever. No, we kicked their ass. Completely. And exactly, I mean, that's exactly the fire. You could yeah, see it's it. It's exactly the game. fire to go into Denver. Yep, yep. And because you could see it in game three, you saw a lot of Phoenix Suns heads down during the game because they knew it was over. You know, and and and, and that brings me to my, my next point about here's the thing. If, if you look at the top three teams in the East and the West, even though the East doesn't matter, uh, in, in the third seed, the Milwaukee Bucks are down three games to one right now. Okay. The New York Knickerbockers are having a closer series than they thought. And Philly should, I mean, that series should be closer than what it is. How the Sixers, they, they were up by five with 30 seconds left and fuck that one up. Okay. Uh, the number one seed, the one that I believe Kendrick Perkins, uh, or maybe maybe it was Shaq as well, said the only team in the playoffs that aren't even going to come close to losing in the first round is the Boston Celtics. Guess what? They lost. Okay? Those are the top three teams in the East. In the West, Oklahoma City should have lost game one. It was only a two-point game, and we all know – it's not a series because Zion's a bitch. Okay. Denver in the, in the number two seat has already lost a game to the Lakers and they should have lost in game two. And I couldn't believe that the Lakers did everything they were supposed to do in game two. You almost felt sorry for them. Nope. And they, they, they just couldn't get it done. But my point is Denver lost a game. The number three seed Minnesota Timberwolves, really didn't come close to losing a game. Last night was close, but you knew it's game four. There's nothing there. Denver or Phoenix got nothing to lose. You knew it. it they're, they're not going to just lay down. But my point is out of those six teams who is, and I know Oklahoma city is undefeated in the playoffs right now, but look who they're playing out of those six teams. Who is the best team so far in the first round? You have to go wolves. Yeah. And right. I, and it's not because I'm biased, but yep. I, I mean, Denver, Denver's up there just I just I don't have any trust in, in in OKC. Um I thought they would kind of falter a little bit just with playoff and experience and what and whatnot, but when you're playing a Zionless Pelicans, yep, yep. I, I you you need to kill that team, and you know. Um, they are, but it's, it's, and not even, they're not destroying that team though. That's, that's the no, thing. And like so. I say, if, if they would have lost game one, it might've been a whole different deal. And then maybe by game four, Zion would have been going, 
oh wait, I, I don't feel so bad now. Maybe I can go back in. You know what I mean? Like I, I can see, you know, if, if Dallas comes out of this uh series, because and I and I think they will, um I think Dallas beats him. Okay. I do. Uh final though, no, we got two more things. I know it's uh, 40 minutes. Two more things, NBA. So uh what I wanted to say, I, I'm hoping, obviously, that L.A. gives us one more day to rest. I hope that L.A., and I never cheer for the Lakers, but you kind of want to give them uh, your hope that they give Denver one one more win against Denver, take it to six, maybe even take it to seven, because I'm not worried about the Lakers at all. Um, did you happen to see in game three, was Low uh, Russell, Angelo Russell, was he eating snacks during the timeout? He Is he just phone, a complete, too. huh? He was looking at his phone, too. He, a complete, you know what? Here's the thing, folks. I have never been more confused about somebody and their job since I went and saw the movie No Way Out with Kevin Costner. I, I've never been so confused. I walked out of that movie, and I was like, how does Costner keep getting work? I don't get it. How does Angelo Russell keep getting a job? He has embarrassed himself in the last two seasons. And, and now he's eating snacks and checking his phone, and he's getting paid a lot of money to do this. I don't get it, but I'm still going to cheer for the Lakers tonight. Absolutely. You should. Oh. Okay. Our final NBA point then, um, speaking of needing a little more time, uh, which would be nice for the Wolves. Chris Finch. Are you fucking kidding me? He doesn't play for the Minnesota Twins. How does, has this ever happened ever? Has an NBA coach ever gotten hurt in the, in the playoffs as, as what, why? I, I don't and, get it. And as serious as he ruptured his patellar tendon. Yeah. He's like got he surgery needs- coming up, which means if they play, if they have to play Denver on Saturday, I don't think... That, that's a pretty serious surgery. So it, it's a serious surgery, and the recovery time is about six months. This guy's going to be on crutches. He'll have a big leg brace. So I, where I do you put him on the bench? Because he is I, – I mean, I love our assistant coaches, but you need that guy on the bench, correct? And that's – it scares me a little bit because I, I don't I don't know the impact that, that it'll have. Like, you, you can actually you, – we're going to be able to see what impact it'll have. I mean, Mike Nori had, had said that, you know, maybe he, he sits on the bench and Mike Nori would be out there on the floor yeah. and, and, and Chris Finch would be Pinocchio or pulling the strings, whatever. And he yes. would just be the, the, the puppet. Geppetto. Out there. Um, yes. Geppetto. There it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. On, but, Mr. Disney. yeah right. <laughs> but it's, I don't know because, and I like Mike Nori. I I think he's a head coach. Oh yeah, he's great. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. But just not right now. I I just no. think it's so unfair. I, I watched it and I was like, what what? How does this only happen? And you know, we had talked about the Wolves being a cursed team, and here all we have been doing is talking about how they we think they have a shot at going to the NBA Finals, but not without Finchie. I I mean I right. I mean uh, Finchie's gonna be there. There's I know no that, but way. what capacity. And I know. And and I will say, though, if someone had to get hurt in this series, right. <laughs> I, I prefer – you never yeah. guess the head coach, but, man, right. if it was someone to tear their patellar tendon, yeah. either Anthony Edwards, Chris Finch, uh, I, you know, so it well sucks. I, I really I really hope he's, he's going to be all right, but um, – that was that I've never seen that ever in my entire no, life. I don't I think don't, that's ever happened, has it? Like I don't know. I, wow. Okay. Now we're gonna switch to some more positive news and and how I love to be wrong, which most people don't don't agree with me on that. But I'm saying, yeah, I'll, I'll be wrong. I'll I'll keep making poor uh, predictions throughout the next coming year if it means good things for our team, but the Minnesota twins are on a seven game winning streak right now. First of all, can you even remember the last time we won seven straight games? I think it was 2019, the Bomba, the Bomba squad. Um, 
but I'm not, I don't fact check me on that one. Okay. So I will say this, let's not start sucking everybody's toes just quite yet. The Chicago White Sox are a really, really, really bad baseball team. Like they did just sweep the Tampa Bay Rays. They, yep, they, they won three in a row. And the Twins, of course, tonight on Monday, the 29th, do have the White Sox in, in um, Chicago. But, man, what I saw from that series, Chicago is a really, really bad baseball team and, like, historically bad. And – you know, God bless them for, for sweeping the Blue Jays because this is a team that I was like, I don't know if they're going to win 30 games this year. I, I was being honest. You know what I mean? It, it's a, it is a tough time to be a White Sox fan if there are any left at this point because it is, it is kind of atrocious to watch that team play no, baseball. Even A.J. Perzinski, I believe he's been trying to like – it seems like almost A.J. has more, uh, I guess – more devotion towards Chicago than he does the, the Minnesota twins. Um, and I can understand that, but he called him on. He said, look, they don't draft any players. They don't develop their players that they do draft. They don't bring any free agent talent in here. They don't spend money. It would be really difficult to be a Chicago white Sox fan. And the only one that I enjoyed watching and he wasn't that good was Tim Anderson. And you don't even have that any longer, you know? So, right. Yeah. I, he was it, Luis Roberts. Uh, all right. Um, can't stand Aloy Jimenez. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a new era for sure. Um, but I just I like remember. Nikki, I like Nicky Lopez. He, he talked to us uh, the other night, his uh, wife, I believe is from Minnesota. So the in-laws uh, we're in town for the, that first game that I, I was at. And uh, he was actually a, a really nice young kid. Um, talked with the fans quite a bit. So I do like him. But, man, other than that, the Sox are, are, are terrible. And then that followed up. Angels. Holy cow. Angels from hell. I, they did everything to lose every game that we played against them. And so that's why I'm saying let's, let's not suck, suck in each other's toes quite yet because it, it is a seven game winning streak, which is hard to do in major league baseball. Um, but the, the two teams that we played made it extremely easy for the Minnesota twins. Well, well they did, um, but they did exactly what they needed to do. And and they won a couple games pretty handedly, which for an offense that was struggling, I texted you, I think on that, that first game, I said that, you know, this is going to be the series that, that, helps this offense and now they have, i mean the batting average team batting average has ticked up, up like 40 points yeah um, they're getting on base they're stealing bases they are moving men around hitting homers um it's just it's more fun to to, to watch and and that's what teams do you know if you want to win you got to beat the bad teams and if you don't beat the bad teams you're gonna have a tough road well the the big point we made was the bats are gonna have to finally start coming to life or it's not. And Santana's bats come to life. Uh, you have, uh, well, Ryan Jeffers was the only guy that was, but he's even getting lucky hits now. You know what I mean? Like, it, I mean, I, you're talking about a team that put 32 runs on the board in three games on the road. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot for anything. Well, and, and, I'm I'm so excited to see Kyle Farmer starting to hit the ball again too, just because I felt so I mean that slumps suck. Like for anyone that has played baseball, you know, when you get in, I mean, even going over five in a game is just it sucks. But he had quite the stretch of just some rough ball. Um, but he's starting to put it together now. And I, have you well, heard about the have you heard about the, the sausage? Yeah, I, I, he already beat me. Man, he already beat me to that. Let's put well, that. I got it right the, here. It, yeah, let's <laughs> put it on the back burner there because I, I want to so, talk, <laughs> talk about a couple other things first, and then I want to ask you about, about that because I know that's a Kyle Farmer deal. Um, but but I was – okay, I let's put that on two back burners because I, I do want to get in. The bats are going. Uh, the law firm – is doing what I think we had, we, we said, give them a shot, let them continue pitching. Right. Uh, I mean, Varlin can't even pitch in triple a right now. It, it, and, and 
I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm still not a little concerned about uh, the, the starting rotation. I mean, happy Pablo day isn't always so happy. You know, yesterday I watched it. I was like, okay, this is what this guy does. And then boom, just like that. It was like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to lose this game. Yep. Yep. I don't, I don't, I, that was the thing. I, I saw him rolling. I, I wasn't able to watch the game yesterday, but saw rolling, rolling. I think he had like a, almost a perfect game going or sorry, no hitter yep. or, or whatever. Um, and then boom, four runs. Yep. You're only up by one run. It's like, just happened so quick and I mean it happens but but this guy's ERA is like over five or, I know. or it's high I know. fours and now yeah. it, it started this way last year uh, he typically doesn't pitch well in April uh you would like him to if he wants to win a Cy Young but um I, I don't know I, Bailey Ober's been shoving uh you know you, you touched on it Simeon Woods Richardson looked great um Paddock's been all right recently uh so it, it's not it's not stellar but it's well as long as if, if your bats continue to go because that's something that happened yesterday it was five four and then suddenly boom it was 11 11 five or what it would you know what i mean and that's that's what happens when you have timely hitting and you have guys um and like santana is completely comfortable at the plate right now and he said that um you know it doesn't matter if i if i if i hit the ball up the middle or i can hit it in the gap or i can take it over the fence it doesn't matter i'm just very much more relaxed. And I think that that's been infectious in the, in the, um, in the clubhouse uh, for, for the twins, because they just look different now. Um, yeah. You got the white Sox again in, in the upcoming series, you got to handle business. You better be, and it's not too much to say you should be on a 10 game win streak after this, this series, because that's how bad the white Sox are. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you're gonna be perfectly happy with two out of three, but with how bad this team is, I mean, just let's let's take three. Let's take three because yep. I understand they swept the Tampa Bay Rays recently, but I don't care. This team sucks. It, yep. it, it absolutely sucks. And you're hitting the ball. You're pitching well. Let's go. Let's 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 run it home. I agree. Now, um, I want to get to this because it, it seems like you are you you're already. Uh, itching to go there. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to start it out, but okay. So you brought up the, the sausage thing and, and it was Kyle Farmer, but I wanted to start that segment off with, um, did you notice that when Trevor Plouffe is in the booth, that's when really great things have happened in, in this year and now last year for sure. But this year his best friend suddenly is hitting the ball and then he gets, to be able to give them a little, uh, well, because because the, the whole sausage thing is Kyle Farmers, right? So he gets even a little best friend endorsement in it. Um, but first, I want you to talk about what you've seen or heard from Trevor Plouffe being in the booth um, and maybe the influence that he has on the guys, because we know he goes into the clubhouse and he talks about it and they they go, hey, you got to say this when you're you know behind the mic. I want you to comment on that first. And then the second, I want you to educate because you're the teacher in this segment. I want you to educate everybody on what, what is, what's the side? Where's the beef? What are you talking about with the sausage thing? Well, let, let's start with Trevor. Uh, Tre Trevor's just a guy. I mean, he is just one of the guys. Uh, he, is, the he is. And I think it's just, it's, I like when he's in the booth because it, it is a, I think he relates a lot with uh, some younger ball players like myself. Um, I think he relates very well with the guys on the field. Um, and he just, the, the relationship works and, and maybe it's, you just needed a guy like that to come in and just say, Hey man, just hit the ball. Yeah. Just hit the ball, you know, like just have fun, just go have fun, hit the ball. Um, and it seems to work all the time. Um, but, but it's been great. I, I, I like, I like having him out there. I know he does too, but um no, this, this sausage, the best part about baseball is all the superstition, you know, ninth inning rally, everyone stack their hats on one guy or yep. everyone wear your head inside out or, um, Hey, I got, I went four for four today. I'm not washing my underwear, um, stuff like yep. that. So, um, this sausage, it, sometimes it just works. He, he 
Kyle Farmer had a Cloverdale sausage. I got it right well, here. That was, that was, is he, but is he endorsing that sausage? No. Or, I thought he he was in cahoots with what is it? Coverdale, Cloverdale, Cloverdale. No, I, he, I don't think so. He's not getting paid by the Cloverdale people. Maybe he is. Maybe he is now too. I don't know. But this guy just had a random. So you can get it at Walmart for nine ninety seven, folks. I mean, it is a ten dollar sausage. Um, it's so it, I believe it was just laying around, and he he grabbed it, put it in the dugout, and it, guys are hitting home runs now. And yeah, and right. And he's tossing it to him. Right. I I yeah. saw even Rocco commented on it, and he said, you know, and now this thing's been his bag for. <laughs> a few days and we're going to get to that here in a, in a second because Trevor blue totally blew my mind. But uh, what Rocco said was he's worried because baseball players are kind of weirdos when it comes to stuff. And I think even Trevor Plouffe commented on it last night. He said, so if this thing is going from city to city in someone's gym bag, someone, you know, down the line is going to, bust into that because it's not like they're bringing a new role in every time. Right. You and you try to like, somebody's got to just take a bite just to see what that's all about, man. I'm like, are you nuts? You know, like, yeah, someone's getting sick. It, one yeah, bite, you're right. getting sick, but, but no, you can't get a new sauce. I mean, that's the sausage, a new sausage yeah. ruins the whole mojo. So you know, just hey, look, I think until you get, if you, if this team, heaven forbid they get in another slump as bad as they were. I mean, yeah, you throw it away because the magic ran out, but um, that sausage, I truthfully, I hope to see it in October too. I heard yeah, right. how yeah, bad right. it might look. And, and that, I mean, I'm just going because baseball players do some weird thing. Now we were talking to um, former twins catcher, Matthew Lee Croy. I don't know if you're too young yeah. to remember him. I love that guy, Tennessee boy. And he said, now it doesn't matter. He says 20 years later, so it's not going to matter now. But at the time he told the story, he said, eh, let, maybe not tell that one, you know, around. He talked about slump busters and what the twins clubhouse did at that time. And a slump buster was if everyone was in a huge slump, everyone took a turn at, it was always the next guy up and he would have to hook up with the most unattractive girl on, on a road trip. And that was the slump buster. Okay. So, you know, that these guys do things that, and could I see a baseball player going, yeah, I'll take a chance on that and eat a in, in nine, a nine week old that's been in a sweaty gym bag, you know, like, yeah, I'll take a shot and see what happens. Maybe it'll give me superpowers. Um, Rocco even said he was a little concerned about that, but um, I, I like it. I mean, I, I liked the uh, land of 10,000 rakes last year uh, yep. because we, did, we don't have – well, we hadn't been hitting home runs as of late, so there was no new – you know, they, they didn't have uh, – I'm glad they didn't do like the Vikings horns or something like that, you know, but this is our new – because each clubhouse usually has a gimmick, you know, that they, they throw around for guys that hit home runs, but I kind of like uh, like the gimmick right now. It's better than Baltimore's. I Baltimore's is kind of weird. The, the spitting of the water. I, I didn't see that. see that one because they made a was... whole section of it, like in the stands, and they would spray people with water after a home run. I don't know. It. That's... I'm sure it was fun for them. It was okay. And guess who started it? Kyle Gibson. <laughs> okay, Kyle, man. Jeez. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, so you talk about Trevor Plouffe being. A good luck charm, also being a Kyle Farmer's best friend. Uh, I think he even talked about Grandma Kay being very uh, pleased with his double uh, yesterday. But I'm telling you, the, like Trevor Ploof is a is a goofball. He's a nut job. But I like listening to him talk. You know, and I almost felt sorry because I really like listening to Latroy Hawkins. But there were times over the weekend that I was like. Yeah, Latroy's not going to get a chance to talk here because Trevor just keep going or whatever. But when he told the story about the sausage yesterday, he completely blew my mind and got me to thinking because he said summer sausage. Now, he's a California boy, right? So obviously he mm -hmm. won't know. But he said, "What? what is summer sausage? What 
constitutes a sausage being a summer sausage. And I went, holy cow, he just blew my mind because I don't know the answer to that. I, I had to look it up. Do you do you know the answer to that? I, I have no idea. I, I always just thought it was a, a, a thing. I mean, I grew up eating it all the time. I, oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And that's why. So when I Googled it, the first thing that came up was, is summer sausage just a Midwestern thing? Okay, but then I, I went, I did some digging, and uh, summer sausage came about in the in the in the days in Europe before refrigeration. So you know you'd use your 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 herbs and your spices to make the meat go a little longer without being able to preserve it the, the correct way. But then you're like, okay, is it a Midwestern thing? Well, sure. Where did all those folks? from Germany moved to, they moved to Minnesota and they brought it with them. And, and I mean, I, I remember, uh, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a, in a house where we ate hot lunch. All right. It was dinner that was it. All right. And so every once in a while on a Saturday, Pa would be frying summer sausage up in a pan, but only like three, like only for him, not for anyone else. And you're like, this is a big deal because the whole house smells like summer sausage but it was only him. So you were like, oh, okay. Then you're like, you got, uh, you know, your grandparents. I mean, well, you know, you know, Herb passed away, but we came by with a, a plate of cheese and summer sausage and Braunschweiger. And, you know, I, I know Herb passed away, but uh, Al, don't you think that Lorraine could have been a little, I, I thought she was kind of rude. No, it was a funeral. I mean, it was always just a part of our lives with summer sausage. Now, pastrami, of course, is, the most sensual of all cured salted meats. I mean, everyone knows that, but, but yeah, this, this summer sausage deal has ties to Minnesota. And I, I think it's, it's great. Right. Because it, at first you're like, well, everyone kind of has something tied to Minnesota. Like you said, you get the land of 10,000 rakes and everything, but, but no, now that, now that you, you bring it up summer sausage, Minnesota, like, and it's going to make you think too, just like the twins name does too. I, I don't know how many times I went to a game last year. Why are they called the twin? Right. Right. Well, if you would have, you know, use your geography brain uh, and you can get it, but I, I love it. I, I do too. And, 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 and like I say, I mean, leave it to a California boy to educate us because I would have, I, I might've gone to, to my, to my grave, not knowing, what some why it was called summer sausage and uh there you, there you go i mean that's and that that might you know because everyone calls us a flyover state no do your history you know that I, I anyways i i like i like that that whole midwest kind of kind of flavor uh to it um yeah all right finally you know it is very rare and that's why i talked about do we now live in Minnesota? Because I've never had a week like I have this past this past week. Twin seven game win streak after going seven and thirteen. You thought, okay, no, they're over five hundred now, right? Okay, the Wolves do something that they never do, and that momentum just keeps building. And then, oh by the way, there was. A NFL draft that I have never looked more forward to and got everything out of it that I wanted when it was done. I was like, this was the greatest thing that, not the greatest because we don't know who J.J. McCarthy is yet, but to me, it was the greatest case scenario of the NFL draft going into it and going, all right, now it's the future, Purple. What are you going to do with it? Your thoughts initially on the NFL draft. Loved it. Loved it. Uh, you know, you had two, two, your two biggest question marks heading in the off season. Well, besides the JJ uh, extension, but um, you had Kirk cousins and you had uh Daniel Hunter and both very, very expensive aging. Um, and you essentially replace them with cheaper, younger models. You know what I mean? Um, JJ is, is your quarterback of the future. Um, and I love, I love the Dallas Turner pick. I absolutely love the Dallas Turner pick to replace Daniel Hunter. Um, I think they gave up. Uh, I, I expected them to trade more picks um, 
And I, I think some people were frustrated how many picks we, we traded away um, to move up just a couple spots. But I think that in the end, it was, it was very worth it um, to get those top two guys. I also think that some of the guys we picked up, I, two of them that I'm looking at um, in the later rounds are actually pretty big. I like Kyrie, like Kyrie Jackson, Jackson. Yep. and I yep. like Will Reichert. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's, let's get to that because, um, you know, and there's still motherfuckers that are, that are upset that we took JJ McCarthy and that, that's fine. You can have naysayers and you can, I like to look at what the finished product is going to look like. Um, but going into this draft and man, it went back and forth and back and forth all the way up to draft day about the amount of quarterbacks in this draft, who is a, a, a sure lot because they were saying up to four quarterbacks are for sure can't miss. And you know that that ain't going to be the case. Okay. And, and so it went back and like up until the national championship game, Michael Pennis jr. Was one of those guys that was going to be a camp miss. So what I wanted, because I knew that we were not going to get, I, for a second, I thought, maybe we would get Drake may just for a second. I thought we were going to do something uh, to pull that trigger, but Jaden Daniels, Dre make uh, Drake, Drake make Caleb Williams, obviously out of, out of the question. If that's what was left, if it would have been between Penix and JJ McCarthy, I wanted McCarthy. And, and the thing that I love about it is that we did not give the farm away to get them. Or our, our second first round pick, we didn't give the farm up. People want to be pissed off about it. That's fine. Tell me what some of our first and second rounders are doing right now. Nothing. Okay, so you give up draft down the road. And it, you know what? Let's focus on what we got first. And they're, they are very, they're going to be very careful with JJ is what I hear. Um, they're very wary about uh, rushing young quarterbacks. I think uh, he's O'Connor the youngest, was, right? He's 21. He's, he's I, the youngest of them all. I think so. Um, and O'Connell is very knowledgeable in that sense, which I think is, it's great to have him uh, as your head coach. And they've set up essentially a performance plan for him with benchmarks that he needs to hit before he's the guy. Um, so it's very possible you see Sam Darnold week one. Uh, you know, if JJ's not hitting stuff, they're not gonna throw him out there to to oh I don't I, I think Darnold, yeah, I think Darnold's gonna be a bridge to McCarthy, and and that's that's fine with me because um here's what I, I was concerned about, and I watched that draft, and like I say, I've never watched or had so much anticipation for the draft and then actually enjoyed what what I was seeing except for every draft when the crowd boos Roger Goodell. I love that. And that happens every, every single year, but here's what I, I thought was going to happen. So you're watching all the pieces go and who's getting taken. And you knew, uh, you knew that the quarterbacks were going to go first. You knew that the wide receiver was going to go fourth, right? Uh, you knew Marvin Harrison jr. You knew he was going to go. It got weird when you talked about who the Jets or the Giants or where it was going to stand at 11. And I wasn't concerned about number at the number eight spot, the Atlanta Falcons. And then out of the blue, the Atlanta Falcons take Michael Pennis Jr. And here is what, what, what I thought when I, when I saw that pick, I was like, Oh, I, I know exactly what happened here. Remember the tampering deal with Kirk Cousins and how Atlanta is, may have penalties because they tampered with Cousins before they could talk to him and blah, blah, blah. So I thought this was kind of one of those like opposite poison pill kind of deals that they were, hey, we'll help you out because we fucked you, not really, by taking Kirk Cousins without permission. So I thought Michael Penix was the guy that the Vikings wanted. And, you know, they were showing him in his college highlights and he was wearing purple at the University of Washington. I'm like, shit, Penix is going to be our quarterback because we just wanted to know that he would be available at that eighth spot. So we made a deal with Atlanta. 
We've got their guy on, on hold, and we're just going to swap the spots. Well, that didn't happen, which I've got to ask, what the fuck was Atlanta doing? Because they didn't, I was like, they've got to trade that or they got to do something. And do you have any idea where, because that was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen in an NFL draft, right or not? I have no idea, no idea what they were doing in the, because you just gave him how much guaranteed money for four years, and, yep. and you just drafted um, this guy who I I don't I don't get it. And and maybe now because people were trying to say that the Vikings were going to do the same thing, where you know you have Cousins, you know if you if you re-signed Cousins, they would still go get a quarterback and have him learn under Cousins, and that's what they'll do. Yeah, but they weren't going to do it for four years for a hundred million plus, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, what's weird. Um, so I, I have no idea what they're doing and it screwed up the entire draft. Like it, it picks were going, you were like, whoa, 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 whoa. What's happened? What's well, happening? It helped us completely, but here, here's what I, if, if you, if you were an Atlanta Falcons fan, I would be pissed off because here's the thing. Michael Pennis jr. Is 25 years old. Correct. What? I believe he's 25 or 24 or 25. He's 24, yep. 24, okay. Meaning that because you've got 100 mil in on Kirk Cousins, Pennis is not going to play maybe unless Cousins isn't ready to go at in week one. But you got to think that if you're Michael Penix, you're going, I want to go now, right? I don't want to wait two years like Jordan Love and wait till I'm 27 years old to be a starter in the NFL. Then on the flip side, Kirk Cousins going, okay, you gave me all this money and now you're bringing in the heir apparent already. And does that mean for this year or next? Now, either way, to me, it has already caused bad blood to your two top quarterbacks. And if you were a fan, would you not be pissed off that you spent all that money on Cousins and then at number eight, you chose Michael Penix. I mean, I would have taken JJ McCarthy over Penix in that spot. I, I have no idea what was happening. I mean, from what I can see, the GM was explaining that they took him because they wanted to avoid a quarterback purgatory. And I don't know fully what that meant for him, for him of just, yeah. I mean, you got a 36 year old quarterback um, who coming off an Achilles injury, you don't know how he's going to do. So I guess, Hey, we can, we can throw Penix in there. Um, and it, it would be better than any other backup that we, that we might be able to throw out there. Um, but I, Cousins was pissed. I know his camp. I, I, his agent. Yeah. Well, we don't know because Cousins doesn't ever really show you what's in his heart, but his agent was like, pretty much let us know that Cousins was not happy about that, that decision. And you know what? Um, that's what you get. You chase the bag. Yeah, um, right. Yep. I, I, I feel, I, I love don't this. Don't feel bad. Nope. Don't yeah. feel bad. Oh, okay. So because of that, that changed things down the road because I believe that was it, were there only two defensive players taken before we took Dallas Turner with the two? So. Okay. Yeah. And we moved up, uh, up to get him. But look, Dallas Turner, complete stud, dude. He is, and he was looked at as maybe being a top five pick in the first round. And we, you know, you want to talk Ontario Smith, steal of the draft. Dallas Turner to me's new nickname should be Sod, okay? Because that was absolute magic. What they got now, not really sure what he what what he said in his interview. I couldn't understand him. Um, so maybe we'll have to get subtitles in the future, but this guy is going to be, and you know what I liked about him? Hey, who do you fashion your game after? You know what his first choice was? Daniel Boy, Hunter. Daniel Hunter. He's so, the heir. Right? I, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And then down the road, we didn't have a second, third round pick, but we took uh, a cornerback out of the University of Oregon, uh, Kyrie Jackson, what is he like six four? 
but he still he's runs bigger. a four five forty. Oh, and by the way, Dallas Turner runs a, a faster forty than than uh, than uh, Jackson. Okay, um, but I'm just saying you have a physical cornerback who's got size and speed, and this guy might help this team this this year. Well, yeah, I mean, he's a, he was a senior coming out. I mean, he he's he he's there. I, I I think, and and that was an area that I think defensively they struggled with. Um, that that cornerback safety position. Um, so I I think it'll be great because I think it puts some some pressure on a on a Makai Blackman on a um, I'm blanking on our other cornerbacks right now. But oh, well, Kayla who, Evans, it, terrible. Yeah, yeah, the one you know. So both. that that's why I think that. It'll it'll be good. It, competition's always great in camp, and and, and Kyrie I think is gonna gonna put a lot of pressure on those guys. And I hope he plays because I really loved his college game. Right, and and you know you're not getting a lot out of Lewis, never to be seen. So yeah, right. I this is what I'm saying. Okay, so I mean I think and and you brought up one other. Now were you talking about the kicker that we drafted? Is that the guy? Yeah, right. Yep. All right. Yep, what, what do you know uh, about? Him? that he's like the best kicker in college football, basically, yep. uh, you know, one of the, the, just a stud, just got a, a tank for a leg. Um, and I think coming into a, an interesting history Vikings with, with kickers. So, um, that'll be uh, interesting, but I, I think it was a great pick round six to get a to get a guy like, yep. like him. Um, yep. that's fantastic. And, and I believe, uh, Turner was SEC defensive player of the year. And, uh, and, uh, what, what's the kicker's name? Uh, Will Riker. Will Riker was the SEC special teams player, uh, but like he's like the best kicker ever to come out of the SEC, I think. I, I mean, yeah. uh, I, I, I gotta love it. Uh, we also did a lot of, uh, signing of, um, undrafted free agents, but I mean, I, I really think, I, we're not there yet. And oh, by the way, uh, did you know that Greg Joseph went to the Green Bay Packers? I did. I did. And I, I guess I wasn't aware of that because I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, Brett Favre, Greg Jennings. Uh, what's the Aaron new Jones. one? Yeah, right. And we, this is what you guys take from us is Greg Joseph. Okay, well, gotta like that. Have fun getting. Have fun. Have no extra points for you. <laughs> but here's the deal. He's kicking on grass. When was he the worst? Was on the road games kicking on grass, and it didn't mean it could be 75 degrees, and he would still. Good luck to Mr. Joseph because I think he was a nice guy, but um, not good at his job. Um, all right. Well, we got a week of – Minnesota Twins baseball, uh, White Sox, and then who, who do we have after the after the Sox? We come Ooh, home. Um, I, I think we do because it was a road trip to LA, then Chicago, then I believe yeah. we come home. Um, I can pull it up here if it, if it would load. Because I'm I'm curious, you know, because you know everybody had such a problem with. The fact that nobody has been um, to Target Field. Oh, we got uh, we got the Red Sox at home. Okay. And then the Mariners. Um, but you know, everybody was upset about the fact that there's no. Well, it's April, all right, and nobody's hitting the baseball in April, so it's 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 tough for fickle Minnesota Twins fans. But you know what? Start knocking the ball out of the park. Things will things will change. Um, we've got Twins baseball. Uh, against two different Sox teams. We have Timberwolves basketball, which I hope that goes all the way to next week, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, Go Lakers, which I would never say in a, in a sane, you know, I've been drinking tonight, so that's cool. Um, and then, yeah, down the road, we got, we got Vikings, Vikings football. So, I mean, Minnesota fans embrace this time right now because this is about as good as it fucking gets. Right now, if you are a Minnesota sports fan, um, anything else you want to add as, as, as we uh, we well reached over the hour uh, time 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 uh, limit? No, like you said, uh, go Twins, go Wolves, get better Chris Finchie. Hope you feel good. Yeah. Um, and uh, let, let's get some more W's here. Right on, man. 
Well, for uh, Noah Storzinger, who, wait a minute, before we go, you may be moving to the state of Kansas because I see that they're going to build a new arrowhead perhaps in Kansas City, Kansas. Have you seen this? Uh, well, I think the Royals might leave too because uh, these these fans, uh, a three-eighths tax is, is too much for the, the, the state of, of Missouri and the fans of these, these teams. So um, don't come complaining when these teams leave because you had every opportunity to keep this team here. Will will the Royals move just across the state line like the Chief? Because apparently they, I they think they're like, leaving. Do you think they're leaving all the way across the ball? If they don't get a new stadium, small. if they don't get a new stadium, which they had a really nice stadium put out there, no one wanted to tear down the strip club downtown to build it. Um, so you know, hey, it it's up to you. It's up to you, Kansas City uh, citizens, because. Um, they, they Do you will think eat. that they'll follow the athletics and go to Oakland now that there's a perhaps a, a vacancy in Oakland? Well, that's what no, they'll, 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 they'll go to to I don't know Nashville or, or some, but it's it, it's interesting time over here. All right, all right. Well, I thought I would, even though I know we had gone over, I thought I would bring that up. Well, uh, for Noah Storzinger, I am Johnny Voss. This is the Show to Be Named Later podcast. Direct from the Mini Met in Jordan, Minnesota. We'll see you next time.